Good afternoon. It's uh, Monday, the 10th of November 2014, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish. With me in the studio, Mike Robinson. And uh, behind the IT equipment is Nick. Uh, well, various reports of the weather across the country. Uh, I, think, uh, I think London is a bit overcast, uh, but I've got a stunning report that North Wales is sunny and also a bit of blue sky and sunshine in Norfolk, uh, grey and a bit drizzly in the southeast, and uh, likewise for the rest of the country. Scotland, no reports, but we'll assume it's raining north of the border. Uh, well, interesting things afoot globally. Yeah, globally, absolutely. And regionally. Well, this is, the, uh, this is the summit on the global agenda, 2014, the World Economic <laughs> Forum's uh, uh, latest global summit. Uh, and they want us all to join them for the launch of the World Economic Forum's Think Tank Leaders Forum, where leaders of some of the world's leading research and policy institutes will discuss key issues facing the globe in 2015. Uh, and, uh, well, guess who's there? Well, Chatham House, of course, as you would imagine, uh, Global Agenda Council on Europe, uh, World Economic Forum themselves, Institute for Security Studies, uh, Global Agenda Council on Latin America and so on. And what they're basically saying is that this follows on from uh, their establishment of the Global University Leaders Forum, where leaders of the top 25 universities around the world um, have been uh, getting involved in helping set global policy. Uh, and uh, they're building off that success, as they call it, um, to do the same with think tanks. Here's some of the, uh, here's a global map. It's not very clear, I apologize for that, um, of the, the countries where most of these think tanks are coming from that are taking part in this. And really what they're saying is that they are using this forum to drive the global agenda. That's what that's the, the phrase that they used in their introductory video, to drive the global agenda. Uh, and of course they want to drive that global agenda through these think tanks um, who themselves tend to be driving policy into, uh, into governments, uh, particularly in this country. I'm sure it's the same uh, most other places. Yeah, policy coming directly into the civil service as opposed to being debated through Westminster. Right, exactly. So a uh, very dangerous little situation there. Uh, I suggest everybody gets onto the World Economic Forum website and has a look at that. Um, in the meantime, um, back here in Britain, um, this, of course, I'm not suggesting that uh, we should keep Britain safe with the European arrest warrant. This uh, graphic was being tweeted out by the Liberal Democrat Party this morning. Uh, and uh, of course, today we've, we're having the debate on the uh, European arrest warrant because this is the uh, the 133 EU police and criminal justice measures that the government opted out for uh, in 2013, and they are going to opt back into uh, 35 of those, um, and that includes the European arrest warrant. So, of course, there's a debate today. They're saying that some conservative uh, bank be backbenchers are going to oppose uh, these plans. Um, but uh, still, there is a majority within Parliament at the moment to, uh, to push this through and bring us back into the uh, European arrest warrant. There's been quite a bit on, on, in the, new, on the BBC recently on this issue, um, and they're really saying that without this, it's so much harder to um, extradite people that Britain is not safe without no. it. Um, and uh, you've got to wonder how we did things before the European arrest warrant came along. Well, we didn't, according to these people. The country didn't function. It couldn't because we, we weren't uh, an inherent part of the European Union. And it's really, it'd be really onerous to, to have to go around uh, individual countries to, uh, to set up extradition, extradition treaties because we've never done that in the past either. No. Well, the whole thing is uh, confusing. And Ken Clark has been telling the Nottingham Post that he's uh, bewildered. He's bewildered by the idea of a British Bill of Rights. And uh, if we just have a look at some of the comment there, Rushcliffe MP Kenneth Clark told the BBC he is bewildered by plans to create a British Bill of Rights. Uh, the Conservative government threatened to scrap the Human Rights Act and replace it with a British Bill of Rights. Speaking to the BBC, he said, I find that rather bewildering. We were promised a drafted bill in due course, which I hope will address this in slightly more detail and correct any misapprehensions I've had etc. Well, we think this is simply uh, part of demolishing our constitution and uh, what uh, Ken Clark is up to here is creating a smokescreen of confusion. So he's stirring the pot over the debate. Uh, people automatically think, well, if there's 
attempt for a British Bill of Rights. We don't have a constitution. He's not sure. Mentally, he's clearly not up to dealing with these issues because he finds it bewildering. Uh, of course, the one thing Mr. Kenneth Clark has not done is called for a substantial investigation into child abuse. Presumably, he's a bit bewildered by that. But let's remember that this is the man who in the background was driving for more secret courts, ties in nicely with the European arrest warrant there. So very, very dangerous individual. This man's not bewildered. He knows exactly what he's trying to do, which is to demolish the whole idea of a set constitution, common law, trial by jury. Ken Clark has been working in the background to bring in secret courts. Dangerous individual, mm. in my opinion. And let's just remind ourselves of uh, who he works for. Uh, David Cameron, um, dirty hands at all times. You know, we're dealing with people who are creating wars. They're lying to the nation. Whole political party is about deceit. And of course, to demolish our constitution forms treason, uh, which is uh, why we've featured it on the front page of the latest edition of the UK column. And uh, if you're a conservative, well, you probably like the idea that uh, we've got um, former Prime Minister Tony Blair. Uh, some of his dirty deals are now coming into the public domain. So the Telegraph here reporting uh, that he had a secret contract, with the Saudi oil company, uh, which was netting him a mere £41,000 per month. Um, and the Petro Saudi source told the paper that Blair had got deep ties to the Middle East, and that's how we got to know him. Uh, we know a lot of people in con common, and they put us in touch. It was a confidential engagement to help us develop business in China. So uh, Cameron, uh, sorry, yeah, Tony Blair, of course, what else has he been up to? This may be a little bit small to see, but it was the Mail uh, reporting that, of course, Blair had also been advising the, the Kazakh dictator on liberty, uh, whereupon the uh, torture and the repression got worse. So these are some of the people uh, who've been running our country. Should we be surprised at uh, the state we're in? Must be hard to only have £41,000 a month. I, I think he looks a haggard because it's yeah. the worry of deciding how you're going to manage to spend that. Yeah. Send some of it down to the UK column, we'll sort it out for you. Well, uh, clearly Eric Pickles doesn't have any problem <laughs> spending £41,000 per month, and that's just on food. Uh, but uh, here we go. He's been also spending money uh, on uh, luxury limos, uh, according to the Mirror here. And, uh, well, he spent £247,775 on two ministerial cars in 2012, 185935 in 2013, and 103091 in the first six months of this year, uh, and they're calling him a heavyweight. Um, the question is, uh, how does he how does how does he get uh, um, help from the NHS when he needs it? Because surely there there are requirements these days for getting uh, health treatment. What if if you're overweight, you're not going to be treated? But well, of course, exactly. he's not going to go near the NHS. He's going to be private, knowing full well the NHS is going to be privatised. I think he should buy a mm. bicycle. Uh, probably, I'd like to see him on the bicycle in his pink geisha outfit, as he was described in the national press. Um, interesting concept, isn't it? Eric Pickles in a geisha's outfit on a bicycle. We're joking, but of course, pretty serious. Half a million pounds worth of public money uh, simply squandered by a man who could do with more than a little uh, walking on a daily basis. Well, interesting to see that um, Holland is beginning to pick up on applied behavioural psychology. And uh, thank you very much to the overseas viewer who sent us this through, Dutch News. And uh, this is a very interesting article, which is actually saying that the government, in this case, the Dutch government, is telling uh, people more and more how to live their lives, what to eat, what to do, what not to do. And uh, the article is going into some depth uh, and what it is describing, of course, is nudging, the very same sort of applied behavioural psychology that's being rammed through in UK. Uh, but here we are with uh, uh, members of the public in Holland uh, picking up on exactly the same thing. Remember, of course, that Common Purpose had its offices or shut down its offices in Holland uh, because they couldn't get the project to work there. 
Um, now, that was a, a pretty interesting event. We haven't seen any further signs of common purpose trying to re-engage in, uh, in Dutch society. Um, was this just a thing to do with language and, and different culture? Maybe. Uh, but um, what a lucky country Holland is. No political charity common purpose at work um, helping with the government's nudging agenda. Well, if you need some good uh, propaganda, um, get out there and buy The Guardian. Um, a, an extraordinary story appeared, um, written by a gentleman called Nick Cohen. Russia Today, Why Western Cynics Lap Up Putin's TV Poison. It's no surprise that the Kremlin delights in piping TV propaganda to the world. Uh, it's guaranteed a receptive audience. So here's this very wise um, reporter from The Guardian. What's he actually saying? Well, this is part of the article. Uh, the posters appearing on British advertising hoardings promoting his, this is Putin's propaganda channel, give a notion of the scale of his effort. His underlings have rebranded Russia Today RT in the hope that its dumb viewers will not realise that they're watching a channel whose political line follows the Kremlin line with puppyish eagerness. And then he goes on to say this, while reputable news organisations from the BBC to the New York T Times fire news reporters who try, however inadvertently, to tell the truth, Russia Today has extended its reach. Uh, so if you watch Russia Today, uh, you're an idiot, you're dumb, and what you really should be watching according to this uh, I would say very ignorant uh, Mr. Cohen from The Guardian. You should be watching reputable um, propaganda like the BBC. Indeed. So we'll add a bit more. He says, by the reality of modern Russia, sorry, but the reality of modern Russia is not the impediment it seems. Suppose instead of trying to sell you Putin, Russia today were to sell you the idea that Britain is as bad as a dictatorship. You might agree, however foolish the sentiment. Well, the sentiment, of course, isn't foolish because what we are seeing on a daily basis is a dictatorship supported by the BBC and its propaganda. And he goes on. Uh, Russia today provides a platform for anti-fracking greens because Putin wants us to remain dependent on Russian oil and gas. Well, that's, that's sheer ignorance because, of course, we don't take any oil and gas from Russia. Well, I don't think Mr. Cohen knows. Cares. Uh, he doesn't really care. This article is uh, worth reading because it is so crass. And I'll give you the last bit. London's banks and law and PR firms work for him, Putin, because the oligarchy pumps money their way in Europe and at the United Nations, bigots of all descriptions welcome Putin's leadership in fighting calls for gay equality and religious freedom. So if you watch Russia today, you're dumb, you're ignorant, you're a bigot. And who says this, Mr. Nick Cohen, uh, to which we say, well, is Mr. Nick Cohen um, naive or unbelievably ignorant? I think I'm going to choose the ignorant. Um, but uh, there we go. Well, a little bit of a small story here, but uh, we wanted to give it as an example of where things take you when you dig a bit deeper. So the Western Morning News uh, had a very interesting little story to say a dog owner who failed to clean up after his pet uh, would have to pay £600. Now I'm sure that many people scanning this would say, well, quite right too, because we don't want society uh, messed up by dogs. Uh, but let's give you a bit of the text. Bude resident Adam Michael was fined £100 and been ordered to pay costs of £500 after a dog in his control fouled some of downs in the town. Uh, magistrates in Bodmin who heard the case in Michael's absence also ordered him to pay a £20 victim surcharge. Now, this is the thing. Welcoming the sentence, Alan Hampshire, head of public protection and business support at Cornwall Council said, we are committed to ensuring people enjoy their local environment free from the nuisance and health risks often caused by dog fouling. So uh, what's going on here? Well, it looks pretty simple. Some people might say a fine of 600 pounds is excessive. Um, 
it was uh, that judgment was in the uh, absence of uh, the gentleman concerned. We wonder whether the court was actually hired by Cornwall Council. Uh, but let's have a look at Alan Hampshire, who's mentioned. Uh, well, here he is. And in this very interesting art article, he's talking about how Cornwall Council is going to survive 30% cuts. Uh, and down at the bottom of the page there, let's expand it a bit. Um, he is considering pursuing EU and government funding for specialist projects, contracts for National Trading Standards Board and CIEH, consultancy services for overseas territories and other national governments, and also support services to local businesses. So basically, the man who is behind uh, looking after dog fouling, when you get into what he's really doing, is he's setting up um, what is a corporatist government where he's going to be dealing with private companies, he's going to be making money, and he's also involved in regulatory powers. Um, we get a better idea of it from this. Um, so here we've got uh, reducing red tape. And this is about partnerships between Cornwall Council effectively and private companies uh, where they're in partnership in order to better serve regulatory needs. So uh, we just, sorry, we just wonder whether some people there are more equal than others. And this is at the back of it, which is uh, the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, which is producing a common approach for competency for regulators. So uh, Mr. Hampshire is not just there doing his job with Cornwall Council. Uh, what he's actually now doing is building a commercial income stream for the council on the back of regulatory powers. So this is part of a presentation from uh, the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. Uh, so they're talking about providing confidence to all the key players, regulatory professionals, local authorities, national regulators and businesses, creates better outcomes. And um, the Better Regulation Delivery Office, BRDO, is working in partnership with the Regulatory Excellence Forum. And uh, where does Mr. Alan Hampshire come back in? Uh, where you can read his comments here, uh, where he's saying it's a key tool to support culture change and a more structured and consistent approach to continuous professional development. So we're asking really what this man is up to. Uh, what we've got is a council which should be there to serve the public, but no, it is going to get into the business of making profit. And if it can make money through regulating Businesses, as businesses and the individual, it's going to do it. How much is he, you're going to pay uh, Mr. Hampshire? Uh, well, this is part of Cornwall Council's leadership team and their salaries, and he's on a call £75,000 per annum. Uh, you did a talk, I think about a year and a half ago, called Cornwall in Cornwall and Concerned. Yes. Um, and um, we do play that out in the live stream from time to time. Um, that was uh, about European money coming into Cornwall and basically just disappearing uh, into, well, into what? Well, into nothing. I mean, the, the big chunk um, was objective one for Cornwall, 320 million, which simply disappeared. So now he's wanting to set up new partnerships with Europe, providing business services using European money. Yeah. And what's going to happen to that European money? Is that likely to be properly audited and, and uh, accounts uh, published, do you think? I think not. I think it'll disappear in the same way. But um, it's worth looking if you're a researcher. You want to go researching and learn a bit more about what's happened in Cornwall. Of course, they've got rid of the local councils and then created one super council, Cornwall Council, covering the whole of the county. So you've got a county now in the hands in in the power of, of very few people. So Cornwall is already a European region in that sense? It's a council in the true yeah. sense of the word. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at a fast, well, it's fascistic, isn't it? When you're bringing in the big corporations to work direct, directly with government, or you can call it communitarian, uh, but Cornwall Council is gonna dictate every area of your life if you allow it. So don't just expect to be fined for dog fouling Cornwall Council will be on your back fining you for smoking in your house, 
failing to take your children to school and on it goes. I mean, it, the staggering part about that was the £100 fine, but £500 in court costs? Yeah. How does that work? Well, probably they were, uh, Cornwall Council were probably renting the court. We know Plymouth City Council does it. Uh, so, of course, they were going to be making money simply out of the court hearing itself. Mm. Multiply that by thousands of people through the year. And you're talking about huge money being pulled st straight out the general public's uh, pockets. Well, many people would have fought and died in order to uh, prevent some form of fascist dictatorship arriving in UK. And of course, we've had uh, Remembrance um, Sunday over the weekend. Uh, just before we go to this year's event, we'd just like to bring you back to 2013 when the UK column uh, reported on what was going on. And here we've got the Express um, article, Lest We Forget, Nation Pays Tribute to Troops Who Made the Ultimate Sacrifice. So we can read that headline against the background of uh, troops now being uh, pulled out of um, Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, many people died, hundreds of people died. And what was it for? Well, these are all the people responsible, of course. Uh, the great and the good all lined up. They really care about the people who've given their life, lives and limbs. Um, we can look a little bit more closely here. Uh, Tony Blair, deeply concerned, of course, that individuals have died. And uh, we were being deadly serious when we picked up on the picture of these three ladies, uh, which we decided to caption, but... Uh, um, Enjoying yourself, dear, from Sherry Blair, uh, to what to which Justine Miliband says, fools, they won't know what hit, what's hit them when Ed's Marxists take over. Um, we're not making a joke of the remembrance itself. What we are pointing out here is what are these people really about? They're there dressed in black with their poppies. They're supposedly uh, there to remember the death and suffering. Um, are they sticking up for the troops? Uh, well, let's bring up Mike Harby, Royal Marine. Um, what's uh, Cameron's Britain done for him? Well, he was imprisoned uh, for upholding common law and the charge was harassment, uh, giving his sons Easter eggs and leaving a birthday card and present on the doorstep. Uh, so um, Mike got seven weeks in prison for that, it was actually increased to eight weeks because of the shock uh, of the uh, general public present in the hearing. So the sheer hypocrisy of the people we've got governing this country and, of course, the way they really treat our armed forces. And if, uh, uh, let's, let's move on to this year. Yeah, because uh, the BBC tweeted this out this morning and, and um, really, if you want to see an, an image that demonstrates this whole... Um, poppy thing at the Tower of London really was about a river of blood. I think that that says it because we've got the, the poppies pouring out of the window of the wall of the tower there. But it's the comment here. This is from Karen Burnham, who's apparently written some books or something, but she was on Radio 4 today program this morning saying, Remembrance has had to evolve, even if it sometimes sentimentalizes conflict. Poppy makes people think. think. And my question is, why has Remembrance had to evolve? Have you got any thoughts on that, Brian? Because it seems like a fairly staggering comment. Uh, well, I'm going to say I think what we're watching, and some people may find what I'm about to say disturbing, but I think what we are looking at is a death cult running the country. And when I saw this image, perhaps, uh, Nick, you just pop it back on, on screen. I looked at this image, and what immediately came in my mind was blood pouring out of the Tower of London. Yeah. I think this is a really sick... Um, uh, what, what are we calling it? It's showbiz, it's sick, it's um, celebrating death. This is nothing to do with remembrance of people who've died. This is a celebration of death. And I think it parallels the very dark images we saw in the Olympics uh, opening and closing. At one point we had young children on hospital beds lifted up to some uh, extremely dark entity. I think there's a lot more going on here. This is nothing to do with remembrance. Right. So it all seems a bit cynical, and perhaps this is pretty cynical as well. Uh, this has been reported elsewhere, but I thought it, would, it was appropriate to bring it in at this point because this is last week's 
Poppy Rocks Ball, uh, run by the uh, Royal British Legion. Uh, and uh, isn't it, I mean, really cynical to have an event like this, which is supposed to be about remembrance, about uh, the awfulness of war, and they decide that they will have Lockheed Martin, one of the biggest warmongering companies on the planet, um, uh, sponsoring the event. Yeah. Uh, it's cynicism on a global scale, really, isn't it? Uh, uh, to the extent that these people are mocking us, I think yes. this is, you take the money from the public, you put it into a charity that is supposedly there doing good works. These people are laughing at us. Yeah. Uh, well, bring you on to this picture, different view, which the Mail Online had, a different view of the poppies, a different view of the British Legion, because the headline is, how your poppy money funds macabre trade in human legs and feet. Five million pound British Legion lab opened by Prince Harry, which is importing body parts for bomb blast tests. Um, so there was a, a picture later in the article. Uh, here was Harry doing the biz. Uh, but the key thing was uh, this was together with Imperial College up in London. And basically they were they were they are importing uh, human body parts in order, they say, to conduct trials in order to protect the troops. So we've got, we've had troops in particular in Afghanistan suffering the loss of limbs from IEDs. Where did the, uh, uh, the training for the IED, IEDs come from? Well, that originally came from Britain, uh, putting in teams who were uh, giving people these skills for use against the Russians. Then we are ending up with our own troops having limbs uh, blown, blown off. Now we have to import body parts in order to carry out these macabre experiments. Mm -hmm. And so you're giving your money for poppies, and this is what's going on in the background. Well, the company mentioned is this one, RTI, RTI Surgical. And uh, what's interesting is they've now got a disclaimer saying that the Mail on Sunday article is, um, uh, is incorrect, that they haven't been... Uh, providing body parts. Um, their ethics are way beyond that. Uh, so I'm just going to bring back to part of the Daily Mail article. It said in 2012, it was claimed that RTI Surgical was sourcing tissue from morgues in Ukraine where documents relating to the deceased were forged. Uh, in one morgue, investigators found dozens of corpses stripped of all their reusable parts while authorities intercepted a minibus crammed with bones and tissue, believed to be heading for a factory ultimately owned by Florida-based RTI, one of the world's leading suppliers of body parts. Last night, the company confirmed it ceased all operations in Ukraine following the reports, adding that it complies with relevant laws regarding consent wherever it operates. Now, I was only able to see their website very uh, quickly, uh, before we started the live program today. Uh, but I think I read that RTI is saying, well, actually, we don't deal in any live human tissue at all. We're just there producing uh, prosthetics and specialised body components. So I'm going to say, please go and visit those two articles yourself. Um, are you giving money to the British Legion? Where's it really going? I think there's some questions to be answered on that mm. one. Right, moving on, economic stuff then. Uh, David Cameron tweeting out this morning that uh, we're spending £15 billion pounds on road building to ease congestion on roads like the A1 and A303, part of our long-term plan to help hard-working taxpayers. So what's this about? Uh, they're basically saying that they're going to build new lanes, they're going to expand uh, motorways and uh, A roads uh, as part of the uh, autumn statement. So we can look forward to further uh, congestion further 50 mile per hour and in some cases 40 mile per hour speed limits um, and uh, they're saying that this is going to be the biggest boldest and most far-reaching road improvement program for 40 years uh, and now they're going to add new lanes but of course in the meantime the currently used lanes are absolutely crumbling so are they going to resurface these roads at the same time i don't think so um, and uh, they're saying, but they are saying that hundreds of extra lane miles on motorways and trunk roads are going to be provided, uh, giving the green light 
to major projects that have been stalled for years. Why are they doing this? Could this be anything to do with a certain Rothschild interest in Britain's road infrastructure? Road charging. With, 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 resp with respect to road charging. Yeah. Um, we know that uh, over the last five years or so, um, as we've been putting up with these 50 mile per hour speed limits everywhere, what have they actually been doing? They haven't been repairing the road surface. They've been installing uh, fiber optic cable everywhere with new central reservations. Uh, in order to uh, turn our motorways into what they're calling smart motorways. Mm -hmm. And what that means is they're going to be recording every journey that's made. Um, we understand that there are um, induction loops in the, in the road surface for, uh, for black boxes that are going to be placed in our cars. Um, and, uh, and as I've already said, the Rothschild uh, Empire has already um, uh, expressed an interest in buying up Britain's road infrastructure when it comes to be privatised, and that is absolutely going to happen. On the in, cards. In, yes, absolutely on the cards. So, uh, But moving on, a spectacular little article here. Let's make shale gas a gift that keeps on giving. This is by uh, Robin Hodgson. Uh, this is by Robin Granfell Hodgson, I should say, Baron Hodgson of Astley Abbott's CBE. And he's a British Conservative peer. Uh, and he's really saying, he, well, he speg begins by saying that the natural assets of a country are, in part, infinite, the sunshine, rain, wind and wave power. Uh, but others are finite. For, for example, coal that powered Britain's industrial revolution for a time uh, and made this country the workshop of the world. And he's really criticising coal here and suggesting that it's finite. Well, let's just look at how finite it is. Actually, Britain at the moment has 3,196 million tonnes of undug up coal in this country um, but that's apparently far too dirty to be using uh, and therefore we've got to use shale gas instead and of course we understand the implications of that. Um, that's admittedly at, at current usage levels only about 50 years but nonetheless that is 50 years worth of coal uh, and so you've got to ask um, why we're not actually making use of that. In the meantime our current coal um, usage is something in the region of 60 million uh, uh, tonnes uh, and we actually import about 50 million tonnes of that. It's ridiculous. We've got 3,196 million tonnes waiting to be dug up, uh, which could be providing people with it's, jobs. It's but much more sensible to ship it in from, where does it come from, Australia? Poland. Or, or Poland. Poland uh, yeah. as, uh, as well. So, so, um, so, but anyway, his article then goes on to, to really comment on, on the, uh, how, how they're going to use uh, the money from shale gas to create what they're calling a... Uh, a, a sovereign wealth fund, uh, which is going to be particularly spent in the north of England. Now, of course, shale gas at this point in time is uneconomical unless it's subsidised by the taxpayer. So what he's really talking about is taxpayer money uh, going into a so uh, sovereign wealth fund. Uh, and it's really just a form of bribery and blackmail in order to get people to accept this industry. Um, and uh, when really we should be using uh, easily available natural resources. It's a bit like wind, isn't it? Bribe people to make sure they take it on board. Yes, especially when it comes from MPs. <laughs> um, um, and then we had this mm. wonderful little article, uh, 10 million jobs to be put at risk from advancing technology. And this has really been the uh, policy agenda from the British government for 40 years or so. But this is, uh, this is Deloitte's uh, and the University of Oxford uh, with a report here saying that... Uh, 35% of Britain's jobs will be eliminated by new computing and robotics technology over the next 20 years. Well, of course, technology does have an impact in jobs. Jobs do change, but perhaps uh, the more sensible place to look for um, the effects on people's jobs is the City of London and the financial system, because we are absolutely seeing the effects of that as we end up, you know, th this mail article, uh, is really asking, the, it's, it's criticising the benefits culture. Uh, but actually, when you think about this, you take a step back and think about this, uh, the mail here is highlighting sandwich making as being the uh, height of Britain's industrial <laughs> output at the moment, right? Mm. And it's ridiculous. This country established the Industrial Revolution on this planet, and yet now sandwich making is the height of uh, Britain's well industrial output and they're saying here that they couldn't <laughs> encourage enough British people to get involved in sandwich ma making so they had to recruit staff from Hungary uh, and of course uh, what what are the what are the salaries on offer here 
the criticism in this article is about the benefits culture and how it is uh, better for people in British people to stay on benefits because they, they earn more money uh, that way than, than getting a job as a sandwich maker. But to me, uh, this really says a lot about where this country has come, how far this country has come in demolishing our productive economy. Well, um, and, uh, can yeah. we give some credit there, Mike, for the government for demolishing this country? Yes. I mean, we're being taken apart by our own government. This is where it's coming from. I, I just don't believe that uh, the average person you know, can't do this, can't do that. The country's been destroyed from the inside. It's treason. David Cameron, Blair, Brown, Nick Clegg, they're all at it. If you're going to have a benefit system, which is which where where low paid jobs and the benefit system make it a difficult choice about whether you're going to get up in the morning, you've got to offer people uh, job prospects which actually inspire them to get up in the morning, and that's something that this government isn't doing, and uh, many governments in the past haven't either. Okay, and go. probably inappropriate for me to say they had to go to Hungary to get the sandwich makers because they were okay. Yeah. Enough of that. Um, serious stuff happening um, in the country and uh, interesting things north of the border. Well, uh, I mean, many people will deny that this type of thing is going on. But of course, uh, we've been hearing so, ma so many reports from people about this type of thing going on. Finally, it's in the mainstream press. Children in Scotland being filmed for snuff movies. Uh, and this is two leading charities. Uh, and uh, the, um, sorry, Break the Silence is one. Uh, and they're saying, uh, in the worst cases, people have been forced to, to watch the making of snuff movies in the extreme barbaric type of terror that can lead to serious... Sorry, it's the extreme barbaric type of terror that can lead to serious personal disorder. Now, of course, we, you and I, uh, were listening to a young boy talking about uh, um, ritualistic abuse that he was experiencing and, and talking about this type of activity going on in front of his eyes and... and uh, Really, it's it's a pretty hard thing to listen to. And right? th those children were taken away from their uh, parents within 24 hours. So so we're talking London, we're yeah. talking two young children uh, on video talking about the most horrific abuse. They've already disappeared into the so-called care system. It's pretty in your face what's, what's going on in this yes. one. Um, and we just remind people that um, if you're sceptical about anything to do with satanic, just remember that the British government approved satanism for use on board warships. So we haven't got to prove whether this uh, satanic agenda exists. Uh, the British government has kindly done that for us. It's approved satanism as a suitable religion for use on board warships. Uh, but of course, what we're seeing is that child abuse performed within the satanic community in Britain, totally protected by the state, totally protected by the courts and police. Uh, so we're, we're just not seeing uh, the scale of abuse. I um, found it interesting in that headline, Mike, they say so-called snuff movies, yeah. as though there's a little bit of, well, are they called that or are they called something different? Mm. Well, but the implication is, well, they're, they're not real. I think that's that's what I'm picking up from Indeed. that headline. Yeah. Well, there are some quite good things happening north of the border. You probably have to freeze this image to read it properly, but it's an email that's uh, been uh, been sent by a gentleman, David Scott, and uh, a lot of pressure um, for a child abuse inquiry to take place in Scotland, as it is supposedly taking place uh, south of the border. Uh, but it does look as though more and more people in the establishment, establishment in Scotland are now starting to realise that child abuse is going on. It is going on amongst the political echelons and the establishment. And the only way to root it out is a full-blown public inquiry. Uh, so uh, Mr Russell here, I believe, is going to speak in the Scottish Parliament, uh, maybe today or tomorrow. Um, but I understand that the point of that is, is he is going to be calling for an inquiry, but we'll bring you more on that in due course. Well, south of the border, um, uh, we have some interesting things happening. Uh, the daily record here um, with um, uh, what it calls shocking hotel footage captures the moment a girl aged 13 is lured into a room to be uh, raped by a paedophile. Uh, if you go and read this article, what you will quickly find, of course, 
is that uh, all of the um, abusers were Asian and uh, the Daily Records article is pointing you back through to work done by the BBC. So we're going to say on one, one hand we are bringing the topic into the uh, uh, limelight but on the other hand we've got the concentration on that all of the paedophiles are Asian. Uh, we have yet to get uh, anybody uh, brought into court uh, from Elm House, anybody connected with Westminster, anybody connected with Britain's security forces, uh, all white people but absolutely no prosecution. So we are highly suspicious of what this uh, data record article is trying to achieve. Uh, in the background, of course, the BBC, well, it's trying to clean up its image by saying, well, the BBC working with the police uh, and producing programmes to show here, here how difficult it is for police in Sheffield uh, to investigate sex crimes. Uh, and this particular edition on iPlayer um, is looking at how the police operate under pressure from budget cuts uh, to protect uh, missing girls. Well, we think this is pure hypocrisy from the BBC. And we're just going to remind people that uh, if you go onto YouTube and you search for BBC Radio 4's Nicola Stanbridge, uh, you can hear a telephone conversation between myself and this lady uh, when she backed out of um, uh, investigating abuse that was carried out at Oxford, uh, Oxford and Cherwell Valley College. And why did she back out? Because she said she'd spoken to the local authorities and the police and well, uh, they said there wasn't any, any wrongdoing. Uh, but we also know that in the background, this lady's editor was clearly keen to pull the story. So the usual trail with the BBC, uh, which is that when you get close to real child abuse, uh, the BBC pulls out and they don't want to know. And I'll also add, that uh, within the abuse carried out at Oxford and Cherwell Valley College, some of the children were shown snuff movies and videos showing the torture and killing and maiming of animals that was so horrific, uh, some of those youngsters still have psychological problems today. None of them have received any proper counselling or compensation, nor have their cases gone to court as a result of a massive cover-up uh, by Thames Valley Police and the local Ox Oxfordshire uh, child safeguarding team, of course, assisted by the likes of uh, the BBC. Mm. But if we complete the circle, uh, here's the same lady being advertised um, uh, as part of a, um, a program to follow the lost trail of military people uh, Big tag with Remembrance Sunday and uh, the yeah. poppy appeal. So um, pretty cynical stuff. Yeah. Right. Over to you. Yes, because this is uh, this beat bullying uh, charity is one of the sort of mainstays of the big society. And so it's real shame to see that, uh, unfortunately, they have gone into voluntary liquidation. Uh, the government is trying to recover. The Cabinet Office, I should say, which is one of their biggest funders, is trying to recover £400,000 that it's given to the charity. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, they couldn't uh, sell this charity on. So they were attempting to uh, oversee the process of actually uh, push this charity onto somebody else, but nobody else wanted it. Uh, and they said that for the past two months, with the support of our legal and financial advisors, we engaged in, in intensive discussions with a number of interested parties with the hope that we secure, could secure the future of beat bullying groups, services, and fulfill our commitment to staff and creditors. The language that they're using is all business language, the beat bullying group. Uh, and, but of course, it's supposedly a charity, but it's funded mainly by the taxpayer. Yeah. Um, so it's, it is absolutely was the, the sort of one of the, the core uh, third sector organizations that began with, uh, uh, sorry, third sector, well, third sector, uh, big society operations that, that began with Tony Blair's third sector and, and uh, uh, push and, and continues with, with David Cameron. So uh, it seems that the, uh, whatever the reason for their uh, financial problems, probably um, maybe, they, maybe they couldn't find enough bullying going on to, uh, 
to, to actually spend money on or something? I don't well, know. the statistics might, we put out a few years ago were, was that there were w over 177,000 charities with a total budget of 44 billion and the 10 uh, largest charities were swallowing up most of that money. And we said at the time, just think about it, if £44 billion a year was really being used to help people in this country, mm. we wouldn't be seeing people uh, couldn't feed themselves or were sleeping on the streets or children in poverty and abused. So something else is at work. And of course, this third sector is nothing to do with charity. It's there to help introduce political control at the lowest level on the back of fraud and corruption, mm. I would believe. Well, we'll leave it there today. Thanks for joining us. We will be back at the same time tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.